Thank you very much, Anit, for that very kind introduction. And I want to congratulate Dr. May for a great lecture on the adverse childhood experiences and how this seemingly ordinary events of childhood could leave lasting impact in the minds of children. My talk now is probably one of the most adverse experiences, not only of children, but also of adults, the parents. Nothing could be more adverse, difficult, and stressful than living in this time of the pandemic. We are living through unprecedented times. Suddenly, we have an invisible enemy that no one really knows, except we see it uh, impact in our morbidity and mortality. There is a pandemic that swept all over the world and no one was caught prepared. And because we didn't know who the enemy is, the only response we could do were the generic responses of how to avoid infection. Personal hygiene in terms of frequent washing of hands, wearing of masks, social distancing, to avoid infection. To implement these things, the ECQ was imposed in our midst. With the ECQ came a lot of stresses and anxiety. I mean, there's enough anxiety just with the pandemic, but with the ECQ, necessary as it was, it imposed social isolation. It imposed... Uh, Loneliness, in effect, you know, so there is elevated level of stress and anxiety. Now, anxiety at times like this is normal because anxiety is adaptive. We have to learn how to face a danger. Uh, the anxiety warns us that there is something not going right. So we have to be ready. But sometimes anxiety can be toxic. It can cross the boundary of normal. When can we say that the anxiety had become toxic? When we find ourselves constantly worrying, pagising pa lang sa umaga, we're already worried about what will happen in the day. Changes in sleep, difficulties in falling asleep or maintaining the continuity of our sleep, changes in eating habits, changes in regulating our emotion, feeling sad, feeling irritable, feeling angry, when we experience these changes, be aware that your anxiety has become high level and toxic. Now, what are the sources of stress in this time of the pandemic? Maybe number one is the uncertainty. Everything is so uncertain. We don't know when this is going to end. We don't know what defenses to use other than the standard uh, uh, protection of personal hygiene and social distancing. One of our greatest fear is the fear of getting the infection, uh, especially among us doctors, because not only, you know, we fear that our infection could kill us, you know, but also we don't want to become part of the problem. We have taken the oath to be part of a solution when there is illness. And also we're afraid that we may pass this on to other people, especially our families, members of our family. The loss of routine that was imposed on us with the uh, ECQ, the closure of community institutions like schools, malls, markets, places of worship, social gatherings, all of these were closed and suddenly we're all together at home 24 seven, wondering what do we do next? Parents are not going to work. Children are not going to school. And so we're there at home. Initially, it's a great pleasure because it's time for bonding. It's time for uh, being together. And children are happy about that. But after a long while, it begins to bear down on us, you know. There is also the problem of information overload. Every time you turn on the TV, there's always something about uh, the coronavirus, the number of people who are uh, infected and the number of people who die, creating a lot of fears in each of us. And of course, 
because of closure of many establishments, because transportation had been stopped, there is financial insecurity. Jeepney drivers had to learn how to beg, had to reinvent themselves and create things uh, in order to have some uh, financial uh, capacities for their families. All of this put together, have, putting a heavy burden of anxiety on all of us. Now in this period, what do we watch out for in the family? First, adults need to be mindful of their own emotional state. Be mindful when you're being anxious. Be mindful when you're feeling sad because you may end up projecting these emotions to our children. And for the children who are already stressed, we have to be watchful of the signs of stress. And what are some of the signs that will indicate that the children are stressed? Changes in their behavior and emotion, frequent temper tantrums, hyperactivity, irritability. A child who has been happy and playful is now clingy to the mother. A child who was pleasant and always enjoying playing with friends is now quiet and withdrawn. Somatic symptoms are very common. Frequent headaches, frequent stomach aches, changes in sleep and appetite, difficulty falling asleep, frequent waking up, nightmares, poor appetite. All of these uh, we need to be mindful of because they suggest stress that our children are experiencing stress. Mm -hmm. Now, in times of crisis, young people need the most attention, but get the least because the adults around them are busy dealing with the crisis and their own stresses. Now, is there evidence that children and adolescents are significantly affected? We have to refer to many studies that are already being done overseas. Uh, in Spain and Italy, for example, two of the most, uh, uh, the two countries that suffered most of the COVID pandemic, uh, the parents of children ages 3 to 18, 1,143 parents, were surveyed and asked whether they perceived changes in their children's emotional state and behaviors. And close to 86% of these parents had said yes. And these are some of the behaviors that they observe in their children. Difficulty of concentrating, boredom, irritability, restlessness, nervousness, feelings of loneliness, uneasiness, and big worries. <laughs> in Wuhan, China, where it all began, uh, 2,330 students grade two to six were surveyed and given standard measures of depression and anxiety. 403 students admitted to depressive disorders. Uh, that's about 22% of the total population. And 337 students or 18.9% reported anxiety symptoms, both are bad enough to be considered actual disorders. Then school came back. The students struggles as the schools reopened. Children always look forward. After a long summer, they look forward to going back to school. Uh, school is a constant in their life. Uh, looking forward to meeting their friends again and saying hello to their teachers. But this time, they are going to be distant learners. They have to stay home. The school is going to be done at home. This is met with a lot of fear, anxiety, uncertainty. This transition is something that happened so suddenly. I think some schools were not ready. Many families are not ready. Their relationships become fragile because they don't see their friends and they have difficulty re regulating their own emotions and adapting to this new system of learning has become very challenging for many children. Um, in the United States, they made a survey of about 20,000 youngsters uh, from grade three to grade 12. 
checking what makes it hard to do at-home learning uh, provided by the school. 64% of the 20,000 children instructions at home as a major in home learning, distance learning. Feeling depressed, stress, anxious were uh, reported by 50%. No adult can help me with my schoolwork reported by 30%. And 27% were concerned about their own personal health as well as the health of members of their family. 25% also said no teachers around to help me with my schoolwork. And big surprise to many of us, limited or no internet access in the United States, limited or no access to a computer or any device as reported by 16%, uh, limited, no internet access, reported by 20%. Think about our situation. As it is now, we are bandwidth is so limited that we all have problems of accessing signals. Think about the children, especially in rural areas. Think of this iconic picture of a young boy who has to walk a few kilometers from their home and stay in a makeshift platform made by the family under a tree in order to access his internet. Mm -hmm. Now, 46% of parents surveyed uh, with children under 18 years old said their stress level was very high compared with 28% of adults without children. This new normal has become very stressful for parents, leading sometimes to burnout. And what are the marks of burnout? When you start feeling overwhelmed and exhausted, and you feel emotionally touched from your own children, like you don't feel, they're going around running wild and you don't even notice, you know, when you lose your productivity and pleasure in your parental role and you start noticing you're becoming very irritable, sad, angry, then these are early signs of parental burnout. As grown up, uh, we need to be good to our body. Uh, it is easy to see that mental wellness begins with physical wellness. We have to keep our body well. Of course, we can continue to be mentally healthy even if we have some cardiovascular or uh, diabetes, some chronic illnesses, but acute physical illnesses makes it very difficult to stay mentally healthy. And how do we maintain good mental wellness? Sleep is a sacred priority. We need to sleep maybe at least seven to nine hours. Sleep especially say six to eight hours would be sufficient, an average of maybe seven hours a night. Why is sleep so important? We all know that sleep is the time when the wear and tear of everyday living is being fixed by our body, right, by our brain. <clears throat> <clears throat> and, you know, sleep specialists, neuroscience tell us that simply being sleep deprived, even if you don't have any significant problems, will result in anxiety and depression. Exercise is very important. We have to move every day. We know the value of exercise in strengthening our immune system, lessening our insight anxiety, improving our mood uh, with the production of endorphins that is there present in our body. And all we need to do is to stimulate that endorphins with our exercise. Endorphins are the feel-good hormones in our body. Find ways to move. Take a walk every morning when the sun is out. Do online exercises. There's so many apps now available online. Maybe dance with your children. Uh, ride on your stationary bike. And if you have a treadmill, do the treadmill. Feed your body well. 
go for healthy options, food options like vegetables, fruits, minimize caffeine and alcohol. Follow a routine. Like we said earlier, the ECQ removed our routines. We were practically stripped of our daily routine. Our body and brain operate on a 24-hour cycle <clears throat> that we call circadian rhythm. Lack of daily structure is a big challenge to our sense of well-being. Establish consistent routine. Time to sleep and time to wake up. Time for meals, time for the exercise, even for bathing, doing the house chores, more or less on regular schedule. What do this consistent routine, what do they do? In an age, in a time when there is so much uncertainty, the routine becomes predictable and establishes a certain sense of control over our lives. The uncertainty of the COVID, the pandemic, has lost our sense of control. It is like we have no control over the things that are happening around us. Also be kind to your mind. It is normal to feel sad, stressed, anxious during times of crisis. But if we allow it to continue and we reach a certain point where the crisis is chronic and high level, then we begin to experience the consequences of high stress. Our human mind can be our most powerful ally or worst enemy. We have no control over the thoughts that come into our mind, but we have some control about the way we react to the thoughts. Many of our patients in psychiatry suffer a lot of negative emotions because of the thoughts that come to their mind without questioning that these are simply thoughts and may in fact not be real. You know? So how do we deal with our mind? Feed it with inspiring, happy thoughts. Did you notice there is so much, a lot of uh, positive quotations circulating around in social media? Mm -hmm. Talking of social media, by the way, have you seen the, in Netflix a very important documentary called uh, Social Dilemma. Those of you who have not seen it yet, make it a point to see it. It's powerful and will help us understand uh, how social media can impact on our own health. But we can also use social media for our benefit. We share, for example, inspiring stories, inspiring quotations, avoid negative thoughts, Avoid information overload. Step back. Take a break. Turn off your TV. Uh, you get your facts from credible sources like DOH or certain groups that we know are credible. Groups of doctors who will present facts as they are and not false news, you know. Practice meditation. There are so many apps in the net. On, that can lead us, help us, guide us to meditation. Neuroscience shows that meditation helps calm our mind and our anxieties. Practice gratitude. Notice things going right rather than dwell on what is going wrong or missing. You know, one day I woke up and realized that, you know, many people did not wake up this morning. And that we need to be grateful even for waking up in the morning, knowing that in this world, there are many people who did not wake up this morning. Practice kindness. Look for opportunities of practicing kindness. If you're going to the grocery, call up your neighbor and say, hey, I'm going to the grocery. Is there anything I can pick up for you? So you don't have to go yourself, you know? We know that practice uh, kindness as we practice it makes a lot of people happy but maybe more important than that making others happy is it also makes us feel good about ourselves now parenting has become a very difficult uh, challenge for many parents in this time of the covid pandemic you know 
the children are there 24 7 no school and now that school is open they're still there uh, demanding our attention because they're learning from home distance learning is the new model so how do we manage to help our child children and juggle up also our you know chores responsibilities responsibilities at home cooking doing the grocery and work from home the who and the unicef had suggested proposed uh, some steps that can be done this is available on public domain in the world health organization and unicef one is one-on-one -on -one time with our children Two, keeping it positive. Don't shout, don't scream. Try to keep the atmosphere positive. Set up some structures. Deal with bad behavior. Keep calm and manage the stress going on at home. And feel free talking about COVID to our children. How do we do a one-on-one -on -one time? Set aside time to spend with each children. Many people call it well time. I call it in time, you know. One of the disciplinary measures we do is time out. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, children, the time out will not mean anything if there is no time in. Time out is only meaningful if they enjoy the company of their parents and now they're told, no, I'm not going to talk to you. We stand in that corner and think about why I'm making you stand there think about what you just did mm -hmm. so spend one-on-one -on -one time with our children even just for 20 minutes or longer listen to them look at them give them full attention and have fun together mm -hmm. ask your child what they would like to do choosing uh, given being given a choice makes them feel more confident if they want to do something that isn't okay with physical distancing then this gives you the opportunity then the chance to talk with them about why it's not allowed a very common story is to say that you know when there is a big storm you don't really go out do you let's there is a big storm going on let's pretend that there is that storm going on and we all need to stay at home in truth there is this dangerous virus that is all around and we don't want to be caught by this virus so we just want to stay home switch off the tv and the phone this is time for you and your child only and on the one-on-one -on -one time ask them ideas of what they want to do this may be a list of what can be done read a book or look at pictures this is for children 12 and below Make drawings with crayons, pencils. Maybe you can dance together or sing some songs. Do some chores together, cleaning up, picking up things in the bedroom, or maybe do a cooking game and help them with their schoolwork. <clears throat> what about with teenagers? Let us not be deceived by their behavior that they don't like to be with us. We always see that when uh, we live with our teenagers, but it is a necessary phase of life. They need to be away from us because they want to declare their growing independence. But deep in their heart, they know they want to be with us. So take the time to talk with them. Well, it's not always easy what to talk about, you know. Maybe figure out their favorite topics like sports, music celebrities friends when my sons were growing up i had to read a lot about the nba and the pba and we had nice conversations about basketball maybe you can ask your teenager to cook a favorite meal together or cook some cookies or do exercise together to your favorite music <clears throat> now keeping it positive Say the behavior you want to see. Don't just yell and say, don't mess up. You're so messy, you know. Just say, 
Will you please pick up your clothes and put them in your cabinet? Mm -hmm. And can you fix your bed? Here, I'll show you how to do it. It's all in the delivery. If you deliver the message with a scream, well, you make it more tough for you and the child. You'll end up fighting. You'll end up with a child who's crying. You get more upset when it could be so easy to say, hey, let's put this together. Can you put your clothes together? And uh, can you help me fix this thing here? You know, And praise your child when they have done something good. A common complaint of children is, my mom and dad only see the wrong things I do. They never see the good things I do. Well, let's get rid of that idea. Let's praise them when we see them doing something good. Structure up. We've talked about routines. Mm -hmm. Create flexible but consistent daily routine because we know this is very important. Make hand washing and hygiene fun. You can play with your children, sing the happy birthday song as we wash our hands. And parents are always model to our children. They look up to our behavior. When we do things with joy, they also enjoy doing those things. Mm -hmm. Now, bad behavior, acting out, screaming, uh, irritability. How do we deal with this? Take a pause. Don't scream, because when you scream, it ends up escalating the problem. Mm -hmm. Redirect. Maybe you can help, you can ask him to do something else, you know. Uh, maybe you can ask him or her to go to the room and fix up the bed. Or ask him or her to help you in the kitchen instead of screaming. Take the time out to talk and say, what's happening, you know. You're angry. Well, it's my little kid sister. She's annoying me, you know. Then it's time for you to talk. Then remember the earlier tips we have suggested earlier, some of the talks and activities that we can do with our teenagers. Mm -hmm. uh, give your child a choice to follow your instructions before giving them the consequences. We use consequences. As much as possible, we avoid spanking, screaming, because they don't really do much good, you know. So you have to have some rules and some consequences when the rules are broken. For example, if you have a rule that says to your child, well, by nine o'clock, you have to surrender your cell phone to me. It's going to be bedtime. And if you don't, I will be forced to confiscate that. The consequence is confiscating. Now, try to be calm when giving the consequence and make sure that you can follow through with the consequence. You don't say, I'm going to remove your cell phone from you. Like one of my patients said, uh, my mom is holding my cell phone because I did something she didn't like. And I said, when do you get it back? She did not tell me anything. I guess it's forever, you know. Well course that cannot happen. Mm -hmm. Taking away a teenager's phone for a week is hard to enforce. Maybe you can take it for an hour or maybe two hours and say, well, I just want you to remember why I removed your cell phone from you for now. And once the consequence is over, give your child a chance to do something good and praise them for it. Do not throw back the phone and say, oh, ayan, tandaan mo yan, ha? Uh, end it with a better way. You can praise him for have, taking this consequence with equanimity, with composure, you know, and just say, you know, I admire you. You're growing up. Mm -hmm. Because when we praise them, they really grow up. Mm -hmm. Now, keep calm and manage the stress. Remember, you're not alone. There are millions of people who have the same fears, the same problems that we encounter. Find someone you can talk to. Call a friend. Connect to a relative, to your sister or brother, and share the problems you're dealing with and see how they're dealing with this. Take a break. When your children are asleep, make a list of the things you also want to do. Take time out to do something that you enjoy because you deserve it. Mm -hmm. And now, talking about the covid be open and listen. 
let them say what they're afraid of. Uh, do not just give them a lecture, a lesson of how bad the COVID is. Listen to them first. And then be honest. Answer their questions as truthfully as you can. Can this COVID kill me? Of course enough, it can kill you. That's why we're all hiding in our house. Because if we get it, there's a danger that we could die. There are also many people who survive. But then getting is, it's scary because we never know who will die and who will survive. Be supportive. When your child is scared or confused, give them space to show them that you are there for them, that you will never leave them and you're trying to make everything as safe as possible so that there is no need for them to be scared. Helping your child with this new distance learning. This is new to all of us. And I worry a lot about the mothers especially who now on top of everything else, the burdens that she is already involved with, including work from home, will now play the role, a very important role in the distance learning that's the new model in the new normal. Well, maybe the first thing you do is try to understand what your role is. Maybe you can ask the teacher, you can ask your friends, understand the expectations for distance learning and ask for help when needed. Call the teachers when you're not sure what to do next. Mm -hmm. Create a little corner, a space dedicated for the study and make it a routine. Uh, you have a specific hours for the study and a specific time to end it. Try to reduce the distractions. If you have a child with younger kids, younger brothers, uh, tell the younger brothers to play around in the room or somewhere else. And it helps to make a checklist together. Ask your child, what are the things that need to be done? And the two of you can put a list together that you can refer to every time you sit in that study corner. Mm -hmm. Make sure that you have breaks. There are recess at school. So give them a break between lessons. Encourage movement, you know. You can walk together or dance together uh, in between the lessons because they need to breathe in fresh air. When they move, they breathe faster and they breathe air, fresh air, more rapidly, which their brain needs because they're using it in their lessons. Mm -hmm. Stay positive through technical difficulties. I know how hard it is, you know, when you suddenly get disconnected and you feel so helpless. Mm -hmm. Stay positive because we are the model for our children. And just say, hey, well, it's that problem again. We'll just have to wait a bit longer. And maybe in the meantime, we can read a book, you know. Acknowledge when, you're, uh, when your child is now your student, does well and encourage them for doing well. And don't forget to have fun. As is often said, laughter is the best medicine for all our woes. And with that, thank you very much for listening. <laughs>